Hello, and welcome to Out West, the official podcast of the Western Governors Association, a bipartisan organization representing the governors of the 22 westernmost states and territories. I'm Jim Ogsbury, Executive Director of WGA. This episode of Out West celebrates the 75th anniversary of National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Finding meaningful employment can be extremely challenging for people with disabilities, despite the many skills and competencies they bring to the workforce. Western governors are committed to addressing inequities faced by those with disabilities and to promoting prosperity and expanding opportunity for all. Today, WGA Policy Associate Lauren Cloward speaks with Bobby Silverstein, Legislative Counsel to the State Exchange on Employment and Disability, or SEED, about the Work Matters Policy Framework, which represents a repository of best practices for improving disability employment. Lauren also speaks with policymakers in Alaska and Washington about the innovative ways they are using the Work Matters Framework to achieve workforce inclusivity in their states. Bobby, thanks so much for joining us today. Can you just start off by telling us a little bit about SEED? Sure. Uh, SEED is basically a collaborative of organization rep- organizations representing state policymakers, including WGA, National Governors Association, National Conference of State Legislatures, Council of State Governments, Women in Government, and others. And uh, the purpose of the collaboration is to provide policy assistance to state policymakers in the executive branch and the legislative branch on ways to expand and improve uh, employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Great. Thanks so much for that background. And for the Work Matters policy framework specifically, how did that come about um, and what is its importance? SEED is funded by the Office of Disability Employment Policy um, at the United States Department of Labor. And the first project um, was basically getting uh, state policymakers together to look at um, best promising emerging practices, policies that have been developed across the country. Um, Rather than reinvent the wheel, it was thought that if we can share Um, policy options that would, and put it together in a document, it would make uh, life a whole lot easier for state policymakers if they can, didn't have to start from scratch. And so the first product was a work matters report, which pulls together uh, hundreds and hundreds of policy options Um, that states have developed in areas ranging from the state as a model employer to uh, embracing and enhancing opportunities in the private sector, uh, state work, uh, return to work policies, as well as disability owned businesses. That sounds like there are a lot of really great resources and support that are available for um, states in this space. So thanks so much for sharing that context. So now we're joined by Kristen Vandegrift, Executive Director for the Alaska Governor's Council on Disabilities and Special Education, Elizabeth Gordon, Executive Director for the Washington Governor's Com- Committee on Disability Issues and Employment, and Rob Hines, Director of the Washington State Division of Vocational Rehabilitation, and they'll help us dive deeper into this issue at the state level. Why is it important to have a diverse workforce, and what are the most significant barriers for people with disabilities in the workforce? And this is Kristen. You know, in my experience, a diverse workforce really includes seeing the world from different perspectives, really allowing the tackling of problems from a different angle, bringing unique skills to the workforce, Ultimately, everyone deserves the ability to pursue the American dream and truly meaningful jobs are for everyone. Um, As I've been working in this field for many years, tackling employment barriers, I've seen a lot of issues around the benefits myth, um, feeling like people with disabilities can't pursue employment because um, they would lose access to their vital public benefits. Um, employer perception challenges, um, certainly access to training and support um, to enable employment. But I think the single biggest barrier that I've seen 
question is truly expectations running across all lines within the community. And I think the story that I'd really tell to exemplify that, um, my brother has significant intellectual and developmental disabilities. And growing up, as we would go out into the community, um, especially as we were older, people would ask us both our names, but they would only ask me, and what do you do? They only expected myself to have a job. They didn't have that expectation of him. And I think as we hold those expectations, those are infused in the policies that we have and therefore the barriers that are present. I think from, from uh, maybe from a people with disabilities lens, I would say that uh, people with disabilities represent a vast uh, talent pipeline. And, you know, it has historically been untapped. And so I think also if you look at that pipeline, you can see that within that pipeline lies uh, innovation, um, a will to meet challenges, um, a proven track record of successfully overcoming barriers to achieving great things. And so, you know, when you, when you look at the barriers that are out there, um, you know, my colleagues here have, have represented those pretty well, but some I think of the most prevalent barriers in the workplace are uh, attitudes about um, and fear of those who appear or seem different than we do in the workplace. And from a business perspective, I think businesses sometimes approach a disability from a defensive uh, kind of a risk averse place. And uh, especially when it comes to uh, reasonable job accommodations. Um, and, and let me just underscore reasonable. Um, my experience has been that most accommodations uh, are of the low tech variety and are usually affordable and very effective. And so I, I just think that um, I, I like to look at this, this talent pipeline and what's the potential there. Great. Thank you all for those thoughtful answers. Uh, next, what drew you to this line of work and what continues to motivate you to work on these issues every day? This is Kristen, and to both of those questions, um, they have the same exact answer. My brother was diagnosed at birth with very significant intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, a very poor prognosis from doctors, but at the time in 1994, um, they recommended that my parents institutionalize him and forget that they ever had him. I'm very blessed that I had parents um, that really believed and had faith that he could have an awesome life, um, but that also said, we know we need to get him the services and support he needs early on to have everything he needs um, to be successful. And so that has been something that has driven my life. Um, it propelled me to start working as a direct service professional um, and then later work for our state BDI um, agency in the intellectual and developmental disabilities unit. Um, and then from there moved to our Alaska Developmental Disability Council. And I think really being able to see, you know, it, motivating me is really seeing people with disabilities actually getting to have those higher expectations, getting to direct their own lives and services. It sounds so simple because we all do it every day for ourselves, but for those in the disability community, it is not that same path that they often get. Um, the ability to direct one's life is so innate um, and yet something that has um, been so far afoot for many in our disability community. So I'm so blessed to, I think right now work at a time where at least in Alaska, we have this developmental disability shared vision that has elevated employment, but especially the talk of meaningful lives and person-directed lives. That keeps me going, even during all of these challenges um, amidst the pandemic, um, and being able to see people with disabilities say, I am changing my own life and I'm directing that. It's really, really powerful. Thank you, Kristen. Elizabeth? Our work is our identity in the United States. And so for a person not to have work and not to be engaging in the workforce is, is a really big way in which people are segregated out. And so being able to work with people to creatively look at their capabilities and figure out how they could get to their dreams really um, is inspiring to me. Um, I can think of one individual in particular that I'd worked with for many years he had worked in several jobs and um, just hadn't really found his niche. And ultimately, an opportunity came up where um, he could apply for jobs in state government. So ultimately, he did get a job. It was with DVR um, in Snohomish County. And his role was to support the various counselors in the office and make sure that they had all that they needed to get their files in order and uh, to make sure that things were being organized. And 
last thing I'd heard, he was set up that he may retire from that position. And he loved his work. Um, they loved having him. And it was just really an amazing uh, success story. And the irony is that going back to the very beginning when I first met with him at his home, um, his parents were really concerned about him working because they didn't think that he should cross the street. And so our initial thing was that we were trying to figure out how we could get him to a job where he wouldn't have to cross the street when he got off the bus. Ultimately, you know, he ended up working in a job where he was crossing the whole county and going to various places. But, uh, you know, in that beginning, people were very nervous and uh, it was a great success. Great. Thank you for that story. Rob? So uh, one of the things that initially drew me to this work is the opportunity to work with uh, professionals like Elizabeth and Kristen. And as far as like the motivation piece to keep going and keep pushing, you know, I know, and I think we all know that people with disabilities are more than twice as likely to be unemployed or underemployed um, as those without disabilities. And even with all the changes that have occurred um, since the Rehab Act of 1973 and the ADA 1990, the needle has stayed fixed um, at a place that I think is still unacceptable. Why did your governors decide to prioritize improving disability employment and the Work Matters framework within your states? This is Kristen, and in Alaska, employment opportunities for all is really generally held up as critical for our healthy communities and healthy economies. Um, Alaska, everyone in our administration really valuing employment um, for individuals with disabilities. Um, recently, our governor actually just issued a proclamation to that effect. And I, and I do think that Governor Inslee uh, recognizes, you know, what that that vast pool of untapped talent is, and uh, and does put his, uh, you know, put his efforts into recognizing the achievements of people with disabilities and promoting uh, employment for people with disabilities to, to see him uh, actually show up to these award ceremonies and shake the hands of these businesses and to make a connection with uh, the people that we are finding uh, opportunities for is, uh, it's, it's both inspiring and it's also critical that we actually, you know, put action to our words. So I, I do, I do think that his priorities uh, shine through in in real ways that people can can see and and understand. So, to me, that's been a very uh, a great thing to witness. All right. This next question we'll start with Kristen. What are the problems you face with disability employment in your states, and how does that compare to the nationwide employment gap for people with disabilities, as Rob mentioned? So in Alaska, I think similar to many states, we've seen um, problems around the employer perception, some of the barriers we mentioned earlier, access to services and support. But I think the piece that um, when I really compare Alaska to other states and the employment gap and just those challenges um, really comes to looking at the nature of our state being so large geographically, um, but also um, so diverse when we think about urban versus rural um, and really what defines a meaningful employment outcome. It's very very different in, you know, the heart of Anchorage in our urban center as compared with, you know, a small community uh, that might be rural or remote in nature. But I, I think one of the biggest things that's really important to realize is just when we define a meaningful outcome for, for those in Alaska, we really look at what's the commensurate employment experience for adults in that community. So in, you know, in Anchorage, that might be having a nine to five job. Um, in, in Bethel, it might be um, a subsistence lifestyle. So it, it just really depends. And so I think for us, it's tackling that problem um, holistically and looking statewide. Um, that's been a really huge piece for us. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, so Washington State, uh, very similar in some of the things that Kristen discussed. Um, we still are seeing lower labor participation rates, particularly in rural areas. Um, we're still seeing high unemployment rates, even prior to the COVID crisis and particularly for people with disabilities in the black community. Next, we're gonna move into some questions specific to states. So Alaska and Washington, we'll start with Kristen um, for Alaska. Please share with us some of your work uh, with the governor to issue an executive order establishing an Alaska Work Matters Employment Task Force and the support 
um, that you've been receiving from SEED and, and what that looks like in your state? So in Alaska, this has been a bit of a journey um, since I came to our Developmental Disability Council in 2013. This really spurred on as we hit into 2018, um, our Alaska Department of Labor um, repealing subminimum wage regulation in our state, only the third state um, to be able to do this. So in our state taking a really strong stand um, that Alaskans with disabilities deserve to be paid at that, um, that same wage as everybody else. Um, but at that same time in 2018, uh, we were very fortunate that um, our governor's office recommended um, our council staff um, and some partners to attend the National Governors Association Employment Learning Lab. Um, at this point, we were connected with the SEED team, which was amazing, um, and put together out of that event um, these recommendations to bring back and present to leadership. As part of those recommendations, it really included um, a work matters task force um, to fully implement our 2014 Employment First legislation. That's a good point. I want to touch on that idea of coordination and collaboration among states agencies a little bit more. How important is that um, and how has that kind of furthered the work that you've done in the task force? You know, agency collaboration is, is critical for this. And, you know, as we worked with the seed team to really think about a possible composition if this task first were to be created, um, we really wanted to make sure that we had um, all the right department leaders there to really look at full barrier elimination. We know that when we talk about successful employment outcomes, it's not just impacting one department or division. Um, so much of the success is in wraparound services and all kinds of different pieces that need to fall into place. Great. That segues well into my next question for you. What are the roles of the disability and the business communities within the, this work that you're doing? How do they play a role? Um, I'm assuming you have, you know, members at the table, but what does that look like? Certainly, and, and as the council, we really have always tried to make sure that individuals with disabilities are providing their voice and um, input all throughout the different work efforts that we tackle, including employment. Um, but working with the SEED team as we kind of put together what a task force could look like in Alaska, Work Matters Task Force, um, obviously we just talked about the composition of all these state agency leaders that need to be there, um, but we want to make sure that this is really infused with direct voice. When we talk about employment outcomes, I think we all can kind of um, agree that having people with disabilities themselves and employers at the table is critical, right? And so SEED helped us kind of think through um, with the structural format of a task force, how we could have an advisory committee component that would have um, business and disability community members present, um, whether it's community-based organizations, self-advocates. Um, we know that um, from our past work, the council has had a federal partnership and employment grant through the administration on community living. And it was so critical on that advisory board to be able to have employer voice there to really, you know, kind of help us shine a light on what could be effective policies to really promote real change. Um, and similarly, being able to have individuals with disabilities, you know, be able to bring up their life experience, their lived experience, I think has been critical. So SEED helped us kind of take that and format it in a way that could be really meaningful for this task force. So it isn't just something where these state agency folks get together and, and you know, in a vacuum. Agreed. Let's turn to Washington now. And my first question is going to be about this idea of state as a model employer. Um, but in 2013, Governor Inslee issued Executive Order 1302, Improving Employment Opportunities and Outcomes for People with Disabilities in State Employment. And the executive order, among other things, establishes hiring goals for state agencies and establishes a task force for the purpose of assisting state agencies with recruitment and retention of persons with disabilities. So if you guys could just spend some time describing the successes and the ongoing challenges to accomplish the goals of that executive order. To back up the train a little bit, the vision of this is that Washington State does a lot of engagement with employers through our community rehab programs and through a lot of different um, avenues to try to encourage private industry to uh, hire people with disabilities. And so the idea was that when you uh, come to the table with that, you want to be able to lead by example. And so by Washington State having 
set, setting specific performance goals around um, hiring people with disabilities, we'd be able to demonstrate that um, not only do we want to participate with public and private partnerships to further work for people with disabilities, but we also want people to have access to good jobs at the state level. Um, there's also been some recent conversation around really looking at how we ensure that that um, goal setting involves people having a progression in their career as well so that people aren't just coming into an entry level position and ending up parked there um, long term. Um, another piece that our state has been working on is making sure that we're working on our culture of inclusion. And I want to turn this over to Rob so he can talk a little bit about one of the strategies we've been working on. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the Disability Inclusion Network um, was established, uh, I'd say we're in the third year now. It's kind of taken some time to get started, but it's a business resource group for state employees um, that really recognizes disability as a normal part of the human experience and, uh, and, and just kind of tries to, you know, I don't like to use the term normalize, but to kind of make it uh, so that it's not so mysterious, you know, so that people have a place to go to learn about, to discuss, and kind of promote disability issues in the workplace um, so that uh, Washington can achieve that model employer status that we, that we are striving for. And, uh, you know, just making sure that it's not just something, uh, the discussion is not just occurring at the HR manager level, but at the principals within each state agency that they're carrying that message that we are including people with disabilities in our workplace and that we want them here and they are a valued part of, of the work that we will accomplish as state employees. And so um, I also wanted to just kind of piggyback a little bit on state employees um, I mean, supported employees in state government. And so we've seen many successes. Uh, I recently attended a 10-year anniversary and departure party for one of our uh, participants, one of our employees in that program, who had worked in the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation doing administrative work for us that was very important. Um, and this person actually promoted to a more coveted role within state government. Uh, so they got a promotion and we got to celebrate 10 years that that person spent with our division. And it was really exciting to see that. So the program works. Um, another thing that I thought would be helpful to talk about in uh, Washington and, you know, kind of engaging the business community is DVR, you know, you may not know, but as of uh, 2014 with the passing of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, DVR has been called out to have a dual customer mode. You know, we've always served people with disabilities but now uh, we serve people with disabilities and business, and they are, uh, we call them out as a partner um, and, a, and a, uh, a dual customer within our model. And so, you know, one of the things that we do is provide training and familiarization um, for things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, you know, the Rehab Act, um, reasonable accommodation, disability etiquette, you know, tax credits. And we can just consult with them on how to make uh, a more inclusive workplace for people with disabilities. Um, I think one example of uh, a partnership within the business community that uh, we're pretty proud of is um, our work that we've done with Amazon. So Amazon created an all abilities or alternative uh, workforce strategy department to help place people uh, with disabilities in important jobs within the Amazon community. So that, you know, not only were we trying to find jobs for people with disabilities, but people were coming to us with jobs and we were trying to fill those job orders uh, from our side of the equation. And so it was an interesting uh, change that we made and we adapted and were able to find customers that wanted to do that work. Imagine that, uh, working for a major employer. And over the years, in the past five years, we've had hundreds of placements with Amazon it's, it's a relationship that's bore, that has bore fruit. And uh, again, we look forward to what it does in the future. So before we wrap up here, I just want to ask you all, um, you know, these are great strategies that you all are doing in your states, but what can other states and what can other stakeholders uh, learn from you um, as they move forward within the disability employment field and improving that for people with disabilities? Just to remember, 
that as we move forward with our plans, um, that we do include, you know, an equity lens, which is, you know, of inclusive of people with disabilities to make sure that that conversation occurs and that if we're the only ones in the room that are willing to speak up, that we are willing to speak up because I've seen many conversations go down the path without the voice of people with disabilities being represented. And I think that when people with disabilities are represented, other people are represented as well. And so it's important to remember that. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out West, presented in partnership with the State Exchange on Employment and Disability. A number of Western governors have made commemorative proclamations in honor of the 75th anniversary of National Disability Employment Awareness Month, emphasizing the importance of focusing on disability employment in October and beyond. These governors include Governors Mike Dunleavy of Alaska, Doug Ducey of Arizona, Jared Polis of Colorado, David Ige of Hawaii, Doug Burgum of North Dakota, Christy Noam of South Dakota, Kevin Stitt of Oklahoma, and Mark Gordon of Wyoming. To learn more about SEED's ongoing work in disability employment, please visit SEED's webpage at dol.gov. And be sure to join us next time as we continue to discuss critical issues facing the Western United States. Finally, WGA would like to thank Bobby Silverstein, Kristen Vandegriff, Elizabeth Gordon, and Rob Hines for sharing their expertise on disability employment. Happy trails, everyone.